Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us a little earlier than normal today. I want to make sure that the uh, pool has plenty of time to set up for this afternoon's major event. Uh, I'm excited to announce that next Monday, uh, on April 24th at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, the President will speak via video conference with the commander of the International Space Station, Peggy Whitson, and her fellow astronaut, Jack Fisher. In 2008, Dr. Whitson became the first woman to command the International Space Station. And on Monday, she will break the record for the most time spent in space of any American astronaut. The President, joined by his daughter Ivanka and NASA astronaut Kate Rubin, will congratulate Dr. Whitson on this incredible accomplishment and discuss the importance of encouraging women to pursue careers in STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and math. As you're all aware, in addition to signing the NASA transition, in addition to signing the NASA Transition Authorization Act, the president also recently signed the Inspire Women Act, which ensures that NASA continues recruiting women for important STEM-related jobs in aerospace, an effort that's particularly important to this president. We're working closely with NASA and the Department of Education to make this conversation available to classrooms throughout the country. The Department of Education will also be providing tools for teachers to build lessons around this conversation between the President and these two outstanding Americans who are orbiting 220 miles above their heads. Uh, the call will air live on NASA TV and stream on NASA's website and Facebook page. And while we're on the topic of upcoming events, I'd like to note that the President will welcome Palestinian President Abbas for a visit to Washington on May 3rd. Uh, they will use the visit to reaffirm the commitment of both the United States and Palestinian leadership to pursuing and ultimately concluding a conflict-ending settlement between the Palestinians and Israel. We'll have further guidance on that visit as we get closer to the date. Um, in terms of additional announcements, the President will be giving the commencement address at the Coast Guard Academy in New London, Connecticut on May 17th. And as we grow closer to that date, we will continue to provide updates. Moving along to current events, this morning the President signed an important piece of legislation for our nation's veterans. The Veterans Choice Program Extension and Improvement Act eliminates the original sunset date on the Veterans Choice Program, which gives veterans who are unable to schedule an appointment at a VA facility in a timely or convenient manner the ability to receive care from an eligible non-VA health care provider. Using funds that have already been appropriated for this program, this gives our nation's heroes the peace of mind they deserve while this administration works with Congress to enact comprehensive reform and modernization at the VA. The Vice President is continuing on his international tour today. Uh, on Tuesday, he spoke to 2,500 servicemen and women on the deck of the USS Ronald Reagan in Japan, thanking them for our ser their service and discussing the President's plan to rebuild our military. He then met with and delivered remarks to Japanese business leader and stop by a youth baseball clinic before leaving Japan. Uh, he is scheduled to land in Jakarta, Indonesia right about now. Uh, we'll have further updates on his travels uh, the rest of the week. Uh, this week is also National Park Week and Secretary of the Interior Ryan Zinke is currently in California meeting with rangers at five national parks. On Monday and Tuesday he was at Channel Islands National Park where he led a class of junior park rangers and today he'll visit Golden Gate National Recreation Area. Since being sworn in on March 1st, Secretary Zinke has met with rangers at nine national parks. He'll make that 10 when he visits Shenandoah National Park outside Charlottesville, Virginia next week. Every American has had the opportunity to participate in the celebration uh, of our nation's parks. They're free of charge this Saturday and Sunday. Uh, anyone who's interested in finding a local park or information can go to nps.gov. And finally, I know just moments ago the President announced uh, that he will be holding a, a press conference next Thursday to discuss the progress that's being made on behalf of our nation's veterans. Um, we'll have further updates uh, on the guidance for next week. Uh, with that, I'd like to take a few of your questions. John. Uh, a couple of un unrelated topics. First of all, Georgia's 6th Congressional District. The fact that uh, John Ossoff holding five or six points more than most Republicans thought that he would have. And Lindsey Graham saying, this is a wake-up call to the Republican Party that there's a lot of moderates that are beginning to emerge in the South to a greater degree that the Republican Party needs to pay attention to. 
I don't imagine that the outcome of the runoff is in that much question, but does Senator Graham have something there that the Republican Party needs to pay attention to changing demographics, particularly in the South? Well, I think you know that based on my former position, uh, we, we talked about changing demographics in, uh, in, throughout the country and, uh, and made significant headway in doing that. And I think in large part, uh, that's why we won. I mean, we had been talking about how the Republican Party had won at so many different levels of our country, uh, but the presidency had eluded us. This president went and got 306 electoral votes, won 30 of 50 states, over 2,600 counties. I think uh, we did pretty well in November, um, and uh, we've continued to pick up uh, uh, seats around the country at different levels, so I feel very confident about the state of the party. The, the fact that Assad came so close to 50 percent, Yeah, I, I would, well, I, again, I, I would just Looking at the facts, the, there was one candidate on the Democratic side. They spent over eight million dollars on uh, one that they backed. I mean, let's. Um, and I think when you look at the total Republican vote, it was it was over that. This is a district that was very close uh, on the presidential level uh, last cycle, and the Democrats went all in on this. They they were clear going into this election. They said that they their goal was to get over fifty percent. They came up short. I mean, so at the and if you look at the what his percentage of what it was presidentially, it, it pretty much tracks. He, um, I think this was a big loss for them. Uh, the bottom line is they went all in on it. They said that they, their goal was to get over 50 percent. They came up short. Uh, unrelated issue. Uh, Tillerson's letter to Paul Ryan uh, on the JCPOA in Iran, is the, is the United States basically saying there's no evidence that Iran is cheating on the JCPOA? No, I think what the letter says is that the president is directing an interagency review of the deal um, as um, to, to, to review that, and we have 90 days before the next one comes up. Uh, we'll have more, but right now we're undergoing a 90-day review, and I think the, pre the statement that the Secretary of State made to Congress very clearly stated that, um, that the President is directing the National Security Council to uh, lead an interagency review of the plan and evaluate whether s suspension sanctions related to Iran pursuant to the JCPOA uh, are in the vital interests of the national security of our national security. That's the letter clearly lays out what the, the president's going to do um, to make sure that they're living up to their agreement. Is the president concerned that Iran may be cheating on the JCPOA? Well, again, that's Dave, David Albright, the noted UN weapons inspector, says they're developing a new centrifuge, which he thinks could be a violation. Of well, the and, and I think that's why he's asking for this review. I, I think that there's if if he didn't, if he thought they were they were, everything was fine, he would have. You know, allowed this to move forward. I think he's doing the prudent thing by asking um, for a review of, of, of the current deal and what's happening. Sean, Try. Hey, Sean, on the USS Carl Vinson, what happened? Can you take us through the events from the perspective of the White House that led to the miscommunication, uh, this administration thinking that this vessel was thousands of miles away from its actual location? I'm sorry, can you repeat the last part? Of the uh, what Can you take us through the events uh, that led <coughs> people within this administration to believe the vessel was thousands of miles away from its actual location? Well, I mean, I, PACOM put out a release talking about um, the group ultimately ending up in the Korean Peninsula. That's the, what it will do. Um, I think we, we were asked very clearly about the, the use of a carrier group in terms of deterrence and foreign presence and what that meant. I think we were, that's what we discussed. I, I would refer you back to any other issues with that to the Department of Defense. Does the President believe that he might have spoken too quickly on this uh, location of the vessel um, before yeah, it was actually arriving? The President said we have an armada going towards the peninsula. That's a fact. It happened. It is happening, rather. Sean, yeah. Sean, I just, just want to follow up on that. Um, you know, obviously when the President of the United States says there's military hardware going to a region in the middle of a crisis on the Korean Peninsula, the mm -hmm. allies of the United States are encouraged. When that happens to not be the case, they can interpret uh, that as a false encouragement. So how is this White House explaining to South Korea and Japan that, in fact, during the buildup and the actual DPRK missile launch, there was no USS Carl Vinson no, off the coast well, of respectfully, Jessica, I would ask you to, to um, either touch base with PACOM or the Department of Defense. The, the statement that was put out was that the Carl Vinson group was headed to the Korean Peninsula. It is headed to the Korean Peninsula. Um, it will arrive there. What's that? It's headed there now. It wasn't headed there. Sure, last no, no, week. but that's not. But that's not what we ever said. We said that it was heading there, and it was heading there. It is heading there. Um, so that that remains. Maybe an impression that allies have. I, but that's that's I. If there's an impression, um, then I, that's not. Then there should have been clarification from people who were seeking it. But I mean, PACOM put out a release talking about what its ultimate destination was going to be. 
um, and that's where it ended up. Caitlin. Well, why did the administration never clarify? Because it definitely, the intent in media reports was that it was headed there now, and now it's going to be there but that wasn't, later. With all due respect, that's not my, we were asked a question. I know, no, 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 that's not true. What I was asked was what, what signal did it send that it was going there? And I answered that question correctly at the time, that it signaled foreign presence, um, strength, and a reassurance to our allies. That's a true statement. Um, you're asking me why you didn't know better. I, I don't know. That's a question that should have been followed up with either PACOM or, or the Department of Defense. But the question, the only question that we were asked was what signal it sent. And I think we answered that very correctly at the time. I think it was a little misleading. No one found out about it until a picture was posted on a page. What do you mean? Page. What, what part is misleading? I'm trying to figure that out. We were asked a question about what signal it sent. We answered the question on what signal it sent. Uh, I'm not the one who commented on timing. Well, what's misleading is that people thought it was headed there now, and now it's going to be there weeks later. They thought it was already headed I, I, there. It but wasn't. again, it was that's doing an exercise. The, I, I understand the question, there. right? But what I'm getting at is um, it, it, it was announced that it was going. It will be there. Um, we were asked simply a question on that. I think all other questions should be asked of the Department of Defense. John. John. Hey. John. Thank, thanks a lot, Sean. Earlier today, China's foreign ministry spokesman said that China is increasingly frustrated with North Korea. And North Korea, you may have seen it, put out a simulated video uh, over the past 24 hours which shows its missiles attacking, <coughs> destroying an American city. What's the American White House reaction to that video and also to the comments by China's foreign ministry spokesperson? Well, in the first part, this isn't the first time that North Korea has put out propaganda tools, and I, I don't think we're going to comment on every time they, they put out a piece of propaganda. Um, second, I think it's encouraging to see China continue to uh, move forward and join us um, in this effort to control North Korea. I, I've commented before, I think that the relationship that the President st started building with President Xi down in Mar-a-Lago uh, is clearly showing some positive signs. China continues to have both economic and political influence over China. And, um, and so I think it's important um, to see them headed in this direction. I think it's a very positive sign to see them uh, play a larger and larger role. I think it is in everybody's interest uh, to contain uh, North Korea's actions. John Gizzi. How strong yeah. is that influence? I'm sorry, John. How strong is that influence, though, if the foreign ministry spokesman for China, uh, which the president is depending on for this particular um, incursion, is saying that he himself, that China itself, is frustrated, increasingly frustrated with the North Koreans. Well, again, I, I think from an overall diplomatic sense, I think it's a positive to see China continue to take positive signs um, aligning with the position that we have on this. That's a positive thing. I think the time will tell, but I think uh, seeing a unified effort to contain North Korea's threat is a positive step. Uh, to protect not only our national security interests, but those in the region. Sorry, John. Gizzi. Thank, thank you, Sean. Um, a few weeks ago, I asked you about the President's upcoming visit to Rome and whether or not he would have an audience with this Pope. And uh, I pointed out that this is something that's a part of modern history, going back to 1959 when President Eisenhower had an audience with Pope John the 23rd, You said it was something you'd definitely be in favor of. A few days ago, the Financial Times reported that sources within the administration said this was very unlikely to happen and that for the first time since more, uh, nearly 60 years ago, the President would not have an audience with the Pope. Yeah, Why? So, so right now, at this time, uh, obviously, we, we headed to both Brussels and Sicily. Um, if we have updates on the schedule, and, and we're still uh, plenty far away, uh, I'm sure that we will let you know uh, about any additional stops. But we're, Are you in touch with the Holy See I, about? I, I, I appreciate the effort, but I think uh, until we have uh, an update, I'm not going to go there. Francesca. Thank you, Sean. Uh, back on Iran in the State Department's letter to Congress, there's been some talk about stricter sanctions on Iran for the ballistic missiles test that it's been conducting and state finance of terror. Are you concerned that tougher sanctions on Iran would violate it to motivate the, or motivate, sorry, motivate it to violate the nuclear deal? Well, I, I obviously, any action that we would take uh, if we did uh, is something that gets vetted through the interagency process and all of those kind of considerations are taken in terms of uh, trying to achieve the effect that we want. So uh, 
sanctions have been an effective tool in, in many cases, and uh, and I think that as we've mentioned a lot of times, the president doesn't telegraph what action he's going to take. But as we conduct a review of options available in this situation, uh, we'll go through the interagency process and have different entities weigh in. Sure, but, with, but but in consideration of those potential right, sanctions, right? Obviously, but we're well aware of. Um, any potential negative impacts that an action could have. And so regardless of whether it's an economic, a political, or a military action, you always weigh all those kind of uh, options. George. Okay, sorry, sorry one, one small follow-up yeah. on that. The President has said, though, that he would like to see the nuclear deal renegotiated with Iran. How specifically does he plan to get a new deal? Is that something that he still wants to do? Uh, well, again, that's why we're un undergoing this interagency review. Part of this is to get uh, the, the entire team to, to look at it as part of the, in the next 90 days um, review that is required under the deal. So we will have uh, recommendations that will be presented to the President on where the deal stands and, and how to act further. George. Uh, thanks, uh, looking ahead to the 100-day mark uh, and setting aside executive orders, can you say what uh, the single piece of legislation that you are proudest that you got through Congress that was on the President's uh, agenda? Well, a, a few things on that. Number one, we're not done. We've got a little ways before we hit the 100-day mark. Uh, so I, I think what you've seen out of this White House is, is a very uh, robust agenda of, of activity. Um, there's a lot of executive orders that I think uh, the President's been pleased with, not only what they've done or what they will do, but what they've done. I think when you look at immigration in particular, we see a, a very significant drop at the border. Um, I think on jobs, uh, there's been a, a lot of activity that we've been very proud to see American manufacturing and job creation. Uh, but then there's pieces like what we did today that I think if you're a veteran who's served our country, um, to know that you have additional options to get health care in a timely manner, um, or not just a, but a geographically friendly manner, uh, so you're not driving hours, is very helpful uh, and, a, and a strong symbol of how we treat our veterans. There's a lot of things that I think the President's done on veterans, on immigration, on regulatory reform. As I've mentioned here, we're now at a dozen Congressional Review Act pieces of legislation that have been signed uh, that have had, I think, a very positive impact on, or, and will have a very positive impact on job creation. Um, when you – and I've noted before to you that, that only one had ever been signed in history before. That's a pretty significant uh, uh, achievement for this President. And obviously, uh, when you look at the confirmation of Neil Gorsuch to the Supreme Court. It's another significant one. But there's there's a lot. And again, we'll obviously spend some time talking about this next week. Uh, but I think we're very pleased with what the President's accomplished. And, you know, as he noted yesterday in Wisconsin, the, the amount that he's done um, overall has been significant. Sean. Zeke. Thanks, Sean. Two for you on two separate <coughs> topics. Um, first, um, on the potential for government shutdown next week in the CR, is the President, uh, the, the, the budget uh, supplemental of the White House request uh, about a month or so ago included moves to defense spending cut and other, uh, and other discretionary spending, non defense, uh, <laughs> include funding for the wall. Um, what is the President going to insist that the CR uh, that will be necessary to keep the government open after next weekend? Will, in, uh, mm -hmm. will include all of those priorities, or does he is, would he accept a sort of a flat CR that would just continue the status quo? The well, obviously, yeah. yeah, we're having those discussions have been ongoing uh, with House and Senate leaders um, as we approach this uh, deadline. Um, but the, as you correctly point out, I mean the president's priorities uh, are very well known. What he wants to do in terms of both military and homeland security. Yeah, but but I think that to, to start negotiating in public will probably not be a very prudent thing to do as we get closer to that deadline. Um, so I, I just I, I respectfully I, we're, we're days away. You'll have plenty of time to see what's in there. Rich, uh, second, oh, second question, another topic. Sorry. Um, uh, late last night, um, the presidential inaugural committee released um, its list of donors, and at the end of the filing uh, period, um, it included you know raised records amounts of money, obviously, included lots of money from corporate donors, many of them who have business before the administration as the president who ran on the drain the swamp uh, slogan, concerned about the, the the perception, certainly, but also any, any, any or, the, or the potential for any real conflict of interest between some of those, the, some of those donations coming into you know, supporting his inauguration. No, I mean, I, I think that this is just like a campaign in the sense that you have the, uh, the, the there's full, disc you know, there's disclosure on this for a reason so that you know what's happening. Um, I think funding the inaugural committee has pretty much been a nonpartisan uh, uh, activity that is going back every administration, uh, going back through administrations. 
Um, so this is this is a time art tradition. I think a lot of Americans uh, and companies and, and, and entities uh, are proud to support uh, the inaugural. And um, and I think that you've seen that over time. The people who have been uh, there are a lot of people who, who really take pride in helping us uh, show the world the peaceful transformation of power. Richard. Thank you, Sean. I just want to go back to uh, Wisconsin yesterday. Uh, you want to go back, huh? It's <laughs> nice. Uh, uh, it's, it's the um, the president said about the the issue with the um, the local uh, uh, dairy producers, dairy farmers, that the White House was going to work on that very hard yeah. immediately. Actually, starting today, that's yep. what he said. Uh, calling Canada and asking for solution. Uh, has the White House been in contact with uh, with anybody in Canada in Ottawa? In uh, I'll, I'll have an update for you, um, hopefully at some point on that. Um, but. I, I, I'm well aware of the President's comments on that. I think it's a very important issue for people in Wisconsin, and, uh, and the President looks forward to following up on that. So he's going to go fast on this point. I, I think I just, uh, all I will say is that the President uh, is going to make sure that we, f we follow up on that. David and Jackson. Very oh, I'm quickly, sorry. he said that on NAFTA, he wants very big changes, or we're going to get rid of it once and for all. Are we at that point, like very big changes? Well, let, or I think no we'll see what pans out in the negotiation. But I think there's, there's an opportunity that, can I just, uh, <laughs> I think I got this, but thank you. Uh, maybe. All right, thanks, man. I'll see you in a minute. Uh, hold on. One All right, <laughs> that was cool. <laughs> um, real quick, <laughs> how do you follow that? Um, just uh, to John Gizzi's point, uh, I just want to make sure I note that, that we will be reaching out to the Vatican uh, to see if a meeting, uh, an audience with the Pope can, can be accommodated. Uh, we'll have further details on that. Obviously, we'd be honored uh, to have an audience with the, His Holiness. Uh, David, I'm sorry, I called on David first. Thanks, Sean. What's the White House's reaction to the deportation of Juan Montez? He's a dreamer from California, right. apparently the first one to be sent back. I, I think there's a, that, the, that situation is, is evolving right now. Um, there's a lot of things that are being looked at in terms of the, the circumstances surrounding that, and I would I'd ask you to stay in contact with the Department of Homeland Security. Did, did President Trump say he didn't want the, the I, I, Again, I think that um, I, I don't want to comment right now in the sense that there are some circumstances regarding that I think that need to come out uh, or, or be further looked into, and I think getting ahead of that um, could be an issue. So I just respectfully I would say that, that uh, I don't want to rush to judgment. I think there's a lot of, of additional details that are coming out about uh, that issue and I, and I think the Department of Homeland Security is probably the best place to, to get updates. And you, I, okay, <laughs> Helen. <laughs> two, two topics and one of those is a follow-up. But I want to ask about GA, uh, Georgia's sixth year. You can ask uh, two quick ones on that. Is the President planning to campaign for the Republican challenger there? Will he go to Georgia to uh, I don't know if, if needed. I think the president's going to make sure that he does everything he can to uh, to maintain majorities and and further the party. But we'll see if we're needed. Is he expending too much political capital on a race that Republicans should be winning easily? Well, I, I, I you know it's interesting. I, I I thought that some of the coverage was a little intriguing as I watched it. Suddenly, that that the, the Democrats went all in on this race. They spent over eight point three million dollars. They said on the record that they were their goal was to win this race. They lost, and the the reaction has somewhat been, um, you know, that they almost won. No, they lost. They made very clear what their goal was in this race. They spent eight point three million dollars and threw everything, including the kitchen sink, at it and lost. And so, no, not in terms of what their stated goal was. They said that their goal last night was to win the race with over 50%. They spent $8.3 million. They didn't run for a runoff. They ran to win last night, and they lost. And so anything short of describing that as a loss is, 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 is sort of inconceivable to me in the sense that that's literally what they said their goal was to do. And they said, we want to win Tuesday night with over 50%. They came up short of their goal. They put all the money that they had in there. They put all their firepower, and they came up short. So it's a loss. Uh, and that, there's no other pick. Mara. Can you just pop on, David, I that yeah. second topic on deportations. And I'm not speaking specifically about this case because I understand that you're referring over to DHS. But there seems to be a little confusion. So if you can clarify, what is this president's position on undocumented immigrants living in this country who have not committed serious crimes? I think the president's priorities on immigration have been very clearly laid out. Uh, the first and foremost, he wants to make sure that people who have committed a crime or pose a threat to, to public safety are, are dealt with uh, first and foremost, and that we would continue to address immigration 
uh, going forward. But That's. So what is the problem? And, and I, I, I guess my question is those who have not posed a threat. Right, and I, I think that, they, that as I said, I mean, the goal and the focus has been on people uh, who pose a threat to national security or, or in some other way in violation. Um, in these cases, I, I, I understand. not posed a threat. So but, I guess but there's that's, I, I, again, and I would, said it was confusing I, I would respectfully suggest that in this particular case, the facts are not completely out yet. So I, I'd rather not jump to judgment on, on what's happening. But there's also Ma case in Ohio. I, I understand. I'm not going to belabor the point. Mara. Thank you. Um, just, I just want to get a little more clarity on Iran. Mm -hmm. Is it the president determined to pull out of this agreement? as he promised during the campaign, or will that decision be determined by this review? I, I think part of the review, the interagency process, is to determine uh, where Iran is in compliance with the deal and to make recommendations to the president on the path forward. So he might or might not decide to pull out? I think that's why you so undertake this a... The, this, this decision has yet to be made. That's why you do, he's doing a review. That was a campaign promise. I, I, yes. Right, and I understand. And that the point that I'm making is that he asked the interagency process, the interagency team, to conduct a review, uh, as the secretary laid out in the letter last night. Anita. Um, Sean, uh, two questions on one issue. Um, my colleague, who's in, currently in Colombia, has learned that the president met with two former presidents of Colombia last week in Mar-a-Lago, and I think it was set up by Senator Rubio's office. And so I had two questions. One, well, first, some people there are saying that it's to undermine uh, the current president's visit next month before he comes here next month. So two questions. One, why was that not released um, publicly to the press, to the pool at the time? And secondly, can you talk a little bit about the point of that visit? And, uh, and do you all stand by the Colombian peace? Yeah, I'll, I'll be glad to look into uh, the circumstances. I. I don't have anything for you at this time, so I will get that something and then, and then read it out. That didn't happen? I, no, I'm just no. saying I'm unaware of the circum. So, that, that so can you get back to me on the policy can, issue? I'm, but why not release that if that's the case? I, because again, I don't know that it's the case, and so until I know, I think it would be tough to answer the second question. Um, thank you guys very much. We'll uh, we'll have an event for you tomorrow. Take care. Have a good one. Can I do a Patriots question? Uh, sure. <laughs>